Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be back at the studio school, and it's kind of strange to be here um, within the memory of my having attended lectures here. And I was, as I was walking, I was remembering a lecture that uh, I was very excited by back in the late 70s um, when John Cage came. And there's a, a classmate here, I don't know if you remember when, when Cage came. I had been very involved with um, him, him and his writings, and I had a, a friend who had read his, uh, Cage's book, Silence, and we, and we chortled over this strange quote that Cage made um, in that book, quoting the, uh, the Gnostic gobble, Gospels in which he said, split the stick and there is Jesus. And so my friend and I, in our kind of adenoidal, sort of Beavis and Butthead style, would always say this. Like it was just seemed so ridiculous and strange. So here comes Cage, and so I raised my hand. It was my, this was my moment of contact with John Cage, and I said, you know, you, you wrote this in your book. Could you talk a little bit about what you meant? Split the stick and there is Jesus. And he said, very disappointingly, it means Jesus is everywhere. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Flush the toilet and there's Jesus. So, um, so uh, I'm going to show uh, slides of my work from the last um, 30 some years. And I have a kind of a neurotic, ticky impulse to make a disclaimer, to apologize, in fact, um, for a few betrayals that I, th I think are occurring right now as I show these slides. One of them is that paintings are, they, they're, they're silent. They don't peep. And here I am chattering, chattering away with this soundtrack that goes, runs against the kind of relationship that paintings seek, which is a kind of one-on-one -on -one relationships in which spectator has freedom to kind of turn their back, put their nose on it, think their thoughts in their own quiet space. That is denied you here in your solitary seats and with me chattering away. Um, so I'm, I kind of want to encourage you. Oh, oh, the other thing is like th that these things are in order, as though uh, somehow there was a sequence that went from this to that to the other one. And, and, and really, it's been kind of crafted with a theme. I've left out 90% of my paintings in order to make some, something that's uh, in the direction of coherence, not actually coherent. Um, and, and I guess the other thing is that these are objects. They, they're not images. And so somehow, in, the, in their kind of translation to, in, in many cases, a slide into a digitized image, then projected on a screen, um, the, the kind of intractable, implacable materiality of the thing is completely gone. And now you have the image. And so that uh, causes me to talk about them in certain ways, as if they were images. Um, otherwise, I'd be chattering the whole time, like, oh, the paint gets really thick around those light bulbs. They're like, it's like bird shit, you know, kind of on top of the picture, whereas the image, you know, goes into it, and all that is completely reduced, especially in cases in which paintings have kind of photo sources. Sometimes, you know, a photograph of a painting with a photo source collapses the, the kind of resistance and difficulty that happens. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry. And please, you know, have your own thoughts. Don't listen to me, or raise your hands if you want. Um, so I'm going to um, just sketch a loose theme here at the beginning um, that will that helped me organize the slides. I, one of the things, one one of the ways I want to talk about these paintings has to do with uh, what I would call inter intersubjectivity, what happens between people but also in, uh, sometimes played out as interspecies relationships or sometimes interobjectivity between objects and, and people. Um, and so this is a painting I made um, thinking about the mid-century painter um, called Dwight Eisenhower. Now Eisenhower took up painting um, during the war. He, was, he happened to be the supreme allied commander for the invasion of Europe, and, and, uh, and his friend Winston Churchill was a painter, kind of a serious painter, and suggested that Dwight take up painting uh, in order to relax. So this is a painting of Dwight and, and uh, Winston going off to do some plein air painting. Um, here comes Dwight again, and I kind of liked thinking about Dwight the painter um, partially just in terms of the radical asymmetry uh, bet in, you know, between his power and the kind of essential weakness of artists 
but that somehow he wanted to be a painter also and, and kind of showed a certain, uh, let's say, girly side for a uh, military man. So I actually made some paintings in which I copied his paintings. So this, is, this landscape is a copy of an of a Eisenhower painting. Now, he, he painted um, copies also. He copied Hallmark cards and sometimes photographs. But I would, use his, I would use my copy of his painting as a kind of location. So this is like a, a seven-foot painting. Yeah? What year is this? What year is this painting? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going, so this is the confusing thing. So I'm starting from about, this is somewhere in the zeros where I did this Eisenhower stuff. So I'm, I'm kind of setting it up. Here, this is another um, painting. He did he kind of preferred um, rustic, um, rustic images, old, old time things? And he painted in a kind of amateur, self-taught way. Um, and I'm, I'm showing these to, in a way to kind of say that there, I'm having a relationship with Ike. It's a little bit of a one-sided one, but I feel like when I repaint one of his paintings, I'm spending time lingering over his decisions, and then when I include another, when I put my own, let's say, characters into the painting, it's a sort of semi-editorial, maybe it's kind of rough play with the man. Uh, like here, I, I substituted my signature in the same font and scale that he had his. He was very proud, proud of his paintings, actually. Um, and, he, and this one has a character in the painting. It's a, it's a, a, a guy with a, a Nike mask. So, the, so this process of like quotation, citation, um, referencing, you know, the, I guess some people would, would, would talk about appropriation, but I, but I kind of like it as, I like kind of using those, uh, those methods as a way to kind of make a thicker kind of psychological story. So the, the act of painting has a kind of resistance or a, a, ch a charge. So here's a, this is another um, way to think about, or for me to think about collaboration. You know, where the the, uh, the collaborator within the painting is a, um, providing a palette for the painter who's painting from life, maybe slightly distracted. So it's kind of an ass palette. I don't know. Maybe not worth. I've never tried it out. So, but then I, I, I do. So I have done many um, actual collaborations and. I was, I was part of an entity uh, known as Team Shag, which was Silman, Humphrey, and Green. Um, and the three of us made paintings together for, for a number of years. We did a couple shows. And this is, um, this is an oil painting from the, I guess from the early zeros, where um, basically the game was each of us would start an even number of canvases. We would split them up, pass them to the other two they would, we would then each be, you know, interact with that and then, and then they would be then divided again so that each of us got to be uh, in the position of starting a painting, being in the middle and finishing. Amy made some kind of joke that, that the, the entity Team Shag was, was really just a, was secretly a kind of an 80s German painter. But I think it's different from 80s German painting. Anyway, this idea of kind of getting inside of somebody else's work, it's a, it's a strange form of intimacy at a distance that, that, I, that I was interested in. And so that's, you know, occasionally we would actually make a single figure. I guess it's in the tradition of the exquisite corpse, except for more, um, more compressed, in which it's not just a kind of a game in which all three parts are, are visible, um, you know, stratified, but... Okay, so now we begin the, um, the, the, chrono the chronological uh, story. And so this is a painting. Uh, this is a very interesting moment, too, because I see in the, in the audience here uh, David McKee. And I remember I made this painting somewhere in the maybe 1980-ish, something like that. And so it's a 12-foot it's a by 6-foot painting. And uh, I remember having David to my studio. And he, this pa painting made an impression. And, and I think, you know, basically led to a, a sort of sustained attention that eventually became representation. Um, and so I think of this as a sort of origins painting. You know, it's the origin of, of, this, uh, of this deer coming out of the guy's head, but it's also somehow for me a moment of, um, of, of beginning in New York as a kind of a person with a career. So it's the 80s, and um, it was a very, it was, it was a good time for me to be a painter, because I felt like painting 
was inconvenient and, and not quite accepted exactly, and, and yet it was somehow genera generationally starting to kind of saturate the, uh, the world. Neo-expressionism, neo-surrealism, which was uh, a kind of a non-movement that I got tossed into, um, sort of for jur journalistic convenience, but, but I kind of cared about images and what they meant. I was, it, it, this one I thought was a, an image of a, of a human trying to be helpful with a uh, kind of com semi-companion species, so in which the, uh, the birds are, are half-threatening but also emerging from the, the, uh, the, the person in the picture. So I was interested in these kind of psychological diagrams. In a way, I think of this as kind of a large brain, a self, somehow divided, somehow being probed, um, that kind of emerges out of this process of painting. There's, so these paintings are very thickly, densely painted. This is another kind of origins painting, and in a way, maybe a kind of a self-allegory, but also maybe an allegory of, 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 co of collectivities to the extent that I think of this zygote um, including a reference to like the, the garden, um, you know, eating the fruit of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, but also uh, washing and chopping down the cherry tree and being unable to tell a lie. So basically, this time I'm trying to, f I'm, looking, I'm looking for analogies, ways to kind of think about anatomy and geography and the, the sort of um, weave them together in ways that, uh, that, that kind of make new images that might, have, that might have a kind of meaning or a depth. It's also the time, now as we kind of move toward the later 80s, a time in which painting itself was being interrogated uh, within the kind of intellectual disciplines with feminism, Marxism, neoconceptualism, and, and, and in some ways painting was being seen as uh, perhaps complicit with pernicious authoritarian forces, and so I, you know, that was, that was an interesting kind of thing to navigate, and I kind of liked the idea that painting could be tainted, but actually is also like a rich, deep language with mem memories, and, uh, and that history somehow could be addressed differently than it could, could in other mediums. So I'm starting to, I like the idea, I want to, and I've continued to, to, to try to kind of metaphorize uh, aspects of the medium, its liquidity, its wetness, its gooiness, um, and so sometimes I'll use its, I'll kind of make a uh, kind of a caricature of its of its gooiness. But uh, at this time, I was I was burying images under glazes of paint and throwing turpentine in them, so that they opened up little holes. And I thought of this that that kind of distress that the turpentine, the corrosive distress, was also a kind of a had um, generative features that they were like, it was like s microbiological life or cell life. And maybe even could become like um, dot, the dot of like mechanical reproduction. But then I'm also think, thinking of ways to metaphorize the ground also, the, the, the surface of the picture. And uh, this was just at a moment when uh, I had a kid. And so every single day I'm like changing the diapers and these disposable diapers are, are um, just part of the, the daily business. And so I thought, oh, right, canvases. This, so, so I have this disposable bi diaper here, and you know, sort of in my mind, it was like the, the, uh, the miracle. You take, you know, you change the diaper, you open it up, and oh my god, it says, spells a word, empire. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking a little bit about what the, uh, the kind of tyrannical, imperial baby, ever hungry, ever, ever commanding. Um, so, oh yeah, also this painting, Sort of like thinking about institutional architecture, like what, like various forms of enclosure or built structure that that articulates or kind of crafts collectivities, groups, and so so I was thinking at the time of other um, kinds of institutions that in which you know individuals are sort of um, forged into groups, and the classroom interests me. I did a whole series of classroom paintings. And then, of course, the family and the family picture is another sort of uh, instrument of, of this kind of articulation of how individuals kind of fit into groups. And so um, I did a, a whole series of paintings based around family images, including my own photographs that I had taken when I was a kid. And so I would go home, find these images 
in the family album, make a photocopy of them, bring them back to my studio. This is the mo early moment of the personal computer. I would scan them so they'd be, become dots. Then I would print out the dots, take a slide of the printout, and project the slide on the canvas. So there's all these kind of iterations, all this kind of generation of reproduction that, in which the paint, which the image became more and more kind of degraded, also opened up a space to project into and um, either conjure things from inside or to, to put things on top of. So I like the idea that the photo image could be something that you establish a kind of dynamic relationship with and which you kind of you vandalize it, you coax things from, you have a whole complicated um, business with. But in a way, what, what happens is you end up destroying all the associations you had with that original photograph. So this is maybe a problem that fiction writers have. Um, like this is, for instance, this is a moment when I, it was my first encounter. This is like maybe the late '80s with Japanese um, cartooning, and I was kind of shocked and d weirdly dazzled by this mixture of like innocence and sexuality and violence, all kind of put together as though you know this was something everyone wanted to see. So I spent time inside the kind of alienness of that, making paintings of some of these characters, folding them back into my own family material. And I guess the kind of the process of, of repainting uh, images redolent with personal feeling and association um, it substitutes new associations for those original ones. And I realized, oh, well, then it's really just about a kind of storytelling. And so I pushed a little bit further back to my parents' wedding, which I thought of as a kind of strange, like a kind of origins ritual. Uh, of which I'm a consequence, but also that I could revisit sort of in the spirit of like a surrealist uh, space creature, space anthropologist looking at the, uh, the peculiar mating rights of, of white people in the, in the 50s. So like maybe for two years, I, I kind of worked with a similar set of source images, like not even the whole wedding, like just a certain couple moments in it. So it was a strange thing to kind of spend a couple years inside of maybe 20 minutes of a time before I was born, but you know, not that far. And so I pushed the stories further and further, making up new things. Like it really, you know, now I guess I thought of it as, as analogous to what fiction writers do, and then maybe like what, fic, what happened to fiction writers, that my family was pissed off. They didn't, they didn't, they thought I didn't have claims to these images, which I, maybe I didn't. So in a way, it, 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 it upped the, the stakes, the kind of psychological stakes. But then at a certain point, I just thought, oh my god, I'm spending all this time with my family. I don't really like spending time with them. Why, what, about, what did I do? That's, uh, that's kind of nuts. So I kind of started to just roll out of it slowly, um, adding new images. And then, weirdly, uh, this movie came out, early 90s, called The Dark Half. Uh, it's a George Romero film. George Romero is a Pittsburgh filmmaker, um, uh, based on a Stephen King novel called the Dar yeah, called the Dark Half. Weirdly shot in the house I grew up in. So there it is. Like not only the house I grew up in, but the house that I made lots of paintings in or of. And so this was a moment in the personal computer in which you could actually start to stream film into the computer. And so I, could, I would do screen grabs, erase everything that George Romero had put in, and, and then plug back into those empty spaces uh, images from my own rep image repertoire. So it was, a it was a strange version of the uncanny, where you're discovering, discovering out in, in the, the sphere of mass culture personal, really personal images. Like, oh my god, that's, that's the stairs that I used to slide down. That's the basement that I used to do all kinds of you know, uh, terrible things. Um, so that I, just, I, liked the, I liked having that kind of strange charge of being both uh, not like a pop artist, but, but addressing media images um, with this kind of, from this strange angle. But eventually it burned through that and moving on. But, but along the way, I kind of adjusted my painterly language. I mean, also is that the computer now is in color and uh, and at this this so this is the early 90s and, and the first my first digital camera um, 
was a toy. Uh, they didn't really, they weren't really proper cameras, but, but I love the idea of taking a picture and having it just immediately printed out in the studio. So this idea that painting it as memory could be kind of tightened up so that like, it's really about the memory of a moment ago through the kind of technology of the, of the camera um, in which the slow, the slowness of paint can kind of get inside of. And then, you know, the process of imagination, projection uh, can be, can kind of interact with that. And I guess I kind of like the idea that painting um, can recapitulate or tell a story about consciousness in a way, the, the kind of layeredness of consciousness, the way uh, <coughs> imagined images uh, play against um, memory, expectation, feelings, context um, simultaneously. So this was like from a snapshot at a, at a kind of ice cream parlor with like tape cassettes, but then I, I decided to, to plug in this strange Felix Vallotton nude. I don't know if you guys know, you guys probably know, hopefully know Felix Vallotton, the Nabi painter, early 20th century, kind of an amazing painter. But I thought, but a strange one. And so I was kind of confused by this image of a squatting woman which her knee is pressing her breast like that. And I thought, Felix, you, you've got something really strange that's making you tick. And I wanted to spend time in the alienness, the strangeness of his desire. So I, so I found myself looking more and more at what I would call rhetorical images, images that, that want, some, want you to want something. So maybe like a, a movie poster wants you to admire or go see the movie. Certain, and, and, and in a way, I, I wanted to preserve the, the strangeness of it. Like this was, this was based on a painting I found at a flea market of this woman with, a, with strange hair like that and, and kind of fingernails. And I thought, somebody thinks this is sexy. I sure, I sure don't. I, I'm going to honor their the strangeness of their desire to me. Try to make a new painting out of it. So this one is based on uh, a, a figure um, by Luca Signorelli. I don't know if you know Luca Signorelli, great, great Renaissance painter from his uh, um, painting in the Duomo of Orvieto, uh, which I think of as kind of the the birth of cheese of beefcake. These these are like super dude. Uh, muscular guys. I mean, Amy, Amy actually Silman refers to it as the Homo Duomo, um, but all the parts are kind of detachable, and I and I found some something interesting there. So I started to look at, at male physique magazines, um, kind of spinning new stories on the complicated ones that are already there. In, in the case of these these kind of period physique magazines, there's like repression, the closet. Um, kind of girly conventions, kind of washing into the, to the guyish ones. Anyway, so actually I made a painting with beefcake meets cheesecake. This is too, so the, the, the figure on the left is kind of inspired by this, this artist called uh, George Quaintance. And he made a guy packed just like that. I tried to honor his, his packing. And, and then there was, here, here's this woman from, a, from cheesecake on a chair in a strange way. Um, so I think of this as kind of an Annunciation painting. The angel comes, bestows goodness, split the stick, and there is the end. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so then I, I thought, oh, someone asked me at a party, this is a strange thing, what are you working on? And because this is, you can never answer adequately. And so I said as a kind of joke, Oh, I'm doing love teams in Arcadian settings. Love teams, Arcadian settings. I, and so later on, I, I, I thought, hey, that's a really good idea. And so I started to kind of mit, match up, do kind of sort of computer dating with um, two different kind of idioms, cramming them together, making these new, these new things. I thought it, was a very, <laughs> thought it was a very clever answer to what at that time felt like a very conventionalized pictorial uh, strategy of postmodern painting, you know, where you pile this on top of that and you kind of uh, make layers that indicate that you know better than anything, you're smarter than all of it, and, and you're detached. And I thought this would be more fucked up. <laughs> but still a kind of a hybrid, um, hybriding, hybridizing of, of heterogeneous languages. So like this guy here is from a, uh, 
he's doing a push-up, but I, I, could, I found if I rotated him, I could find different mates for him. And so the mates that I found were all from student paintings. So I tried to kind of get at the awkwardness of student nudes, various ones. <laughs> he's he's found, his, found his mates. Okay, so then, the other, I mean, the other strange thing is, of course, you never know. When, or some people do. I did not know that maybe perhaps my paintings reflected uh, my own ex experience, what's going on. And all those love teams of like tr uh, couples trapped in kind of awkward relationships. I was, in fact, in the middle of a marriage that was breaking up. Oops. So then that broke up and, and then, you know, found a new person. And so the paintings started to evolve. And all of a sudden, they're like way more strange dynamic and tangled into each other, not quite as grafted. But I guess this idea of the essential, of the otherness of the, of the, the loved object is, um, is the kind of navigation that, that, that people make and that I think is, or is worthy of paintings. Like, what, is it, what does it mean to, to be tangled? And I was in Rome at this time um, with my future wife, and I was completely dazzled by this image of couples on motor scooters. It was kind of like a futurist fusion of bodies and machines, you know, as they kind of course through the ancient city. So this painting is, is um, thinking about that moment. And now, okay, now the internet starts to come. I mean, it's kind of weird to have, uh, the, the, to have the development of these paintings tracked against, you know, the emergence of the internet. So at this at this time, I'd, I had been going to flea markets and yard sales and finding vernacular source material that I could either read, depict. But now I could actually go online and look at amateur paintings. And so th this was a painting I made based on a loose copy of a painting someone else had made of themselves and their child dressed in clown outfits. So this is a self-portrait projecting onto that. Same time, I'm starting to make some sculpture. These are a little sidebar here. So this is the somewhere in the mid '90s. I would go to these flea markets and buy ceramic figurines, match them up with other ones, and and kind of glue them together with uh, paper pulp. So it was a little bit like the sort of love team kind of construction, except that I hope that these were um, I don't know they had different sort of content. I would make these these totems. Um, and somehow the objects, it was, you know, the, the objects had their own complicated history of having been designed by somebody anonymous, manufactured by a company in order to make money, somebody actually buying it, either giving it as a gift or, you know, cherishing it, and then not cherishing it. Here it shows up in the, in the, uh, in the flea market. So that itinerary of the, of the thing through kind of various designs and desires, I thought, um, kind of enriched it. Then I did, I did a series of sculptures based on um, pairs of, a, of identical uh, Kmart stuffed animals, partly as a kind of a way to, res to enlarge what I was doing, but also to kind of respond to what I, what I call the, um, uh, uh, the solicitations, or the, the kind of the solicitations of the object to be touched. That's what, it seems like that's what plush does. Stuffed animals, you know, one conventionally hugs them and holds them. And so I thought I could make a sculpture that would be a kind of a misreading of that solicitation, that this, this would be a touch that actually just completely buries them under. Here's some more, some more sculpture just in the, in the studio. Um, so now we're, we're sort of jumping ahead a little bit, but this is in the sculptural uh, segment of our show. Um, this was a, a, a sculpture I made of a, of a kind of ceramic poodle which I, I love ceramic poodles, are so incredibly artificed and, and uh, I mean, poodles already in their grooming are super artificed, like topiary or something, animal topiary. So this, this is a marble, marble carving I made based on a, uh, a poodle in Pietro Santa. Um, so this is in the early zeros. So learning how to carve was, was, was a great adventure and I added this pillow to it and I guess in the spirit of Italian art, thinking about um, Veronica's veil, right, the Veronica um, I'm suddenly feeling very Christian today. I don't know. Um, Veronica mops the mops the face of Jesus as he as he climbs to the to Calvary with his cross, and miraculously the uh, his image appears on the on the um, 
napkin, the, the handkerchief. And that, and that supposedly is the source of all the images of, of, um, of Jesus. I guess St. Luke being the first painter who kind of copied it, the, the veil is lost. But anyway, so this one is kind of a clown version of that. The clown, clown, the clown cries into the pillow and miraculously the image is there, ever joined with the poodle. Here's a, uh, this is a large sculpture of a wave that doubles as a, uh, a hutch, a display hutch for um, ceramic figurines. This was on the show I had at uh, Sikkima Jenkins, I guess in 2004 maybe, and so you see some paintings in the background. Is that the only one I have? It is. So this is severely pruned. And then I, I've also done some installations. This is, this is an installation uh, in Harlem at a place called uh, Triple Candy, also the mid-zeros of uh, where, which I used inflatable snowmen, like 20, 12-foot inflatable snowmen to make a new narrative, to re-narrativize them. My method was, I thought, the way I said this, this sounds kind of pretentious and fancy, I would, I would try as much as possible to desemiotize the snowmen, which were already kind of blank, and then re-semiotize them according to this new narrative, with, with, which I thought had to do with miscegenation, interracial coupling, and um, thinking about the relationship between ghosts and snowmen. These were amazing things. I mean, you see them in uh, suburban lawns. Um, they're inflatable. They have these little motors in them, and they have lights on the inside. And so they, they have a kind of quivering agitation and a kind of uncanny, beautiful radiance. So that was the other trick, too, was to sort of break, to destroy the architecture with these things instantly. You just plug them in. So this is like maybe, oh, I don't know, 20 feet by, by 12 feet. And these are a stack of them. Where I, it makes a great painting ground, this, this nylon. But I try to optimize all the features of the, uh, the object, the found object. Um, that, that's the uh, intake air hole. Um, and then also I could, use, I could make paintings and, and mix the paintings up. But I realized it was a, um, it was a kind of a very efficient way to address a large space. I had a, sh I had a, a show in, in Switzerland and I know they didn't have enough money to ship a lar large painting, so I, I just shipped these three small ones and then, and then found a way to kind of paint the wall and, and, and engage them. And, and so the, it was like a game structure. Here's these three paintings. How can I, how can I put them together in a, in a painting? This was like my first foray. Here's something I did more recently in the basement of the Romanian Academy in, in Rome. So there's just one, there's, I mean, this is a very long, long hallway, but there's just, just one little painting hanging there of the head of the leopard. And the rest is just the house paint on the wall or vinyl tossed onto the floor. And this was in London at a, at a very inspired um, gallery in the East End uh, where, I mean, you can see that the, the electrical work was not very uh, refined. But it was a kind of a great moment to, to, to sort of honor and pay attention to all the details of the architecture while making a new, a new thing. So just around this time, so back to painting, and here we go. This will we'll rush to the, to the finish um, with acrylic paintings. I had a, I'd, I'd always done sort of acrylic underpaintings and just didn't really like the material that much. Um, it seemed flat, it dried too fast, harder to get nuance. But then I had this kind of feeling of just wanting, wanting to kind of disorient my habits, my skills. And so acrylic was a way to, to do that and, and, and also just to kind of simplify it, to maybe to shake some of the historic associations of, old, of, uh, of oil paint. And so I made this painting, which is in a way, I, and the other thing was that the acrylic white was this beautiful white. It didn't yellow, didn't shrink. I was getting frustrated with that feature of the oil paint as I was kind of burning, burning them out, like having the light go brighter and brighter. Um, and so in a way, this is a kind of reflection on whiteness, uh, thinking about the ground, ma making a, maybe a metaphor between the, the nourishing blank whiteness of the, of the bread and the kind of you know, fecal gooiness of the peanut butter um, under, the, under the kind of innocent gaze of the, of the kitties. So I like this idea of the, you know, the kitties as, um, as like spectator, like they, you know, they're very 
alert, they're very attentive, their eyes are wide open, and you, you can really have no idea what they're, what they're thinking. And so I like this, this, this uh, returned gaze. I did a, did a number of them, and in fact, it's very easy to make a kitty. You just throw some paint down, put a pair of eyes on them, and uh, you're, you're off. So try it. Try, try. Here they come, unaware of, maybe slightly aware of, of the dangers uh, that, are, that surround them. But I do love the image of the wave. The wave is like a brushstroke. It's you know, it's a fro it's like liquidity frozen. And um, you know, and here maybe it's a kind of a romantic idea of the brushstroke as a as a sort of colossal force of nature. Here the kitties are distracted from their 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 predatorial nature by by the strangeness of this other this other being. But thinking about you know twins and doubling and um, and these 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 kind of considerations, I think I think painting has always kind of danced around, come close to, backs away from um, mechanical reproduction, printmaking, and doubling. Not that this painting is, a, is an essay on that, but I but I like the way um, painting can kind of hold its distance from and then occasionally roll up its sleeves and, and engage. Uh, the ever unfolding kind of uh, consequences of, of new technologies, to imaging imaging technologies. So this one I, ca I call this is sort of dumb. I call it poo dogs. It's as though like somehow the dog's poo could be shaped into into more dogs. This is a great big painting, actually, like maybe nine feet tall. Um, so we're we're advancing into the the late zeros. This was a, this was a painting that was in that show with this with the wave sculpture, um, and I, I was kind of inspired by seaside gift shops. There's almost always like um, their sculptures of waves, with porpoises kind of leaping out of them, and then you know you get towels with that image, and and uh, and I, I I don't know if that ever happens, but because if it does, they would they would, they seems like they would be beached, <laughs> but I but I like it as a kind of an ex, an image of kind of ecstatic uh, ecstatic power. This one, this one was um, based on a, a memory of a painting that I saw someone had made of, from a photograph of, their, of a kid being kissed by a dog. And there's something about you know, children as pets or you know, interspecies relationships or domestic um, you know, strangeness. So here comes some more white paintings. I liked how these paintings look on a gallery wall. I think of galleries in, the, in their kind of prim whiteness as a way to isolate the images, to, to, to have them separate from the world in their own kind of vivid uh, intensity. Um, and I realized that it's kind of, it's interesting to do that within a painting so that, um, so that the objects, the colored things stand out against this kind of chilly Arcadia blankness. And so that when these hang on walls, they, they kind of merge, they emerge from the wall But also paint somehow, I, I, and I guess maybe this is part of my infatuation with that acrylic white paint, was that you, you sort of layer it onto the canvas like it was snow. It kind of buries everything under and, and, um, and makes it slightly more beautiful. More, more coupling. So this 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 I made it's it's a little bit out of date. I made this one in like 2008. I was in Rome, but I was still thinking about um, I guess what is it the way I like how snowmen I mean they're really made out of water and it's the simplest kind of representation of a person. It's just three spheres of diminishing size. You make this person, and then as the weather warms, the 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 snow melts and, and returns back to water. And so I like the idea that this, this snowman is in a warm place. He's doomed. He's going to return to the state represented in the lower left, but that, but that his face is a kind of classical uh, image derived from kind of a Roman, a Roman senator, I believe. So, uh, and then the gestures somehow in their frozenness somehow they have the memory of their former liquidity now, now stilled 
uh, in, this, it would, in a way analogous to his never melting. Even though he's sweating, he's kind of caught in a... So here's more wintry, wintry tears. And one of the things I had never really, really kind of examined was uh, gesture. Like I, I, I liked handmade paintings. I loved gestural paintings, but I, I didn't ever really, f never felt justified in it. And I even felt slightly wary about gesture as a kind of a show-offy gratuitousness. Um, you know, I mean, de Kooning is one of my favorite painters. It's not the case with him, but uh, but a lot of you know contemporary artists sometimes use gesture in a way that. I didn't really believe, and so I wanted to find a way to, to use gesture um, that would be consistent with my interests. And so I used it as a kind of perf performance in which I almost painted in character. I would just kind of set it up like, here it is, this is gonna be on a stage, the gestures are going to happen, they're gonna be in space, and then, so, and with acrylic paint you have to do it, it takes like three minutes. It happens so fast, you sort of plan it out, do it, and then spend months trying to make the painting. So there's grooming and pruning. and So in this case, this performance space with the microphone, I thought, kind of charged the gestures with a slightly different, um, different character. So that the frozen sweep of this percussionist um, drumming in, you know, set on the stage with all those uh, martial amps somehow rubbed the silence of her performance against the kind of bravura of these gestures, which are like six feet long. Um, yeah, this is a six foot, six foot painting. So here thinking about painting as performance, fi finding a kind of painter surrogate inside the painting. Now, you know, I'm, I'm saying all this stuff. And again, I just want to say don't, you know, just take everything I'm saying a with a little grain of salt. Um, you know, and because in fact painters do this all the time, they'll they'll sometimes protect the secret truth of the work by talking about all this other stuff. That's that's like almost you know almost convincing. Um, so what am I thinking? I'm thinking about like conditions of ecstasy of the frozen moment of the ecstatic performance. Here, the skateboarder, you know, getting wheels up. Like it's curious about the underside of skateboards. You don't really see them when you're skating on them. You don't see them very often. But if you become airborne and there happens to be a photographer there, there it, is, it is like a key signifying element. So I, I was thinking about this sort of primitivistic modern image under the skateboard while, while this woman catches, catches this moment, underwritten by all this kind of painterly uh, turbulence. So I guess, what, so what, what is the condition of the ecstatic? This is, this is not, I don't think it conditioned the ecstatic, but I like how um, there's a kind of stepping outside of one's body, like the losing of boundaries. In I mean, I think that's maybe literally what the ex, what the ecstatic means, you know, to that's to be the outside. And so I think of images of immersion as another echo of that. That when one is in the water, at least it appears that you that the boundaries between yourself and the and your environment are are blurred. And so this is kind of thinking about that. Here's you know the reflection of the of the stone becomes some kind of new a new thing while the the protagonist um, swims. So this is a very small painting. In fact, it's a terrible photograph, but but I feel like it's a kind of a more kind of somber um, immersion experience. But in, way, in ways in which the immersion kind of pulverizes the body into kind of, into kind of component parts that then reorganize in a new in a new way, which is what we do, painters do. So I like I like somehow giving giving that imaginative process maybe like a kind of cubo modernist um, process a sort of thematic um, uh, valence. So this is this this one has a has a weird story and I, and I I should keep it short. But my friend Charlene von Heil had a studio down the hall from me. She had these stretchers that she decided she didn't like. She there was another person in in the hallway who had a, had kid had a kid and she had her kid and their friends over and they made this giant 
collective finger painting, which she then decided to throw out. And when I saw it at the dumpster, I thought, this is amazing. I gotta, I've got to do something. So I kind of used that as a sort of jump off into this immersion-themed landscape with the, with the person up to their thighs um, while someone else is way in the distance. I don't know if you can see it. There's somebody maybe shouting or waving or something. But um, yeah, this makes me want to actually get some, get some children's slaves to come make some figure paintings for me. <laughs> um, I started thinking about Walt Disney. I was doing a project with this guy, an artist called Adam Sianovich. And we decided to do a collaborative exhibition. Um, we, th we thought, oh, let's make, a sh let's make a biography of a single individual. We, as a, as a collaborative team, will become this one person and make a show. And so we, we, we fixed on Walt Disney. And so I spent a while, uh, about a, a few months, researching Walt, his life. Um, here's, this is Walt, Walt painting, painting from life. And so we made this show at Postmasters where I kind of parsed Walt's, Walt's life into four kind of locations with a few narrative, um, key narrative moments in it. And so we made the show in which Adam has a, he has a process of painting on Tyvek. He adheres it to the wall like it's a mural. Um, and then I hang paintings on his mural. And all my paintings were kind of, um, what do you call them, like episodes in the life of Disney. So this is early Disney. He, he remembers riding a pig in mud. Um, it's so interesting, like all that stuff on the top, it looks like it's a sound stage, but that's all Adam kind of being clever and making, making our exhibition into something that would be like a sound stage. This is the central moment, and which I kind of um, ended up referring to as the Damascus moment in Disney's life. The, the golden age of, um, of animation is over, which is the 30s, the, the 40s come, and it's the war. Uh, he does a lot of propaganda. There's a strike at the studio. He becomes disillusioned. He's radicalized to the right, and he takes up um, Pol he takes up polo. It's his big passion. He rides, he plays, until one day he has an accident, and the other guy dies. And he never gets on a horse again. That's the end of polo for Walt. And his new replacement hobby is model trains, which lay the tracks for theme parks. So that's our, that was the thesis of the show. There's, a, there's a many other parts to the show. I'm just you know glancing over it in the, in the spirit of the encapsulated David Humphrey lecture. Back to painting, more paintings. Um, I like thinking of ways to get, this is maybe part of a sort of, of postmodernism by other means, like uh, the, the idea of the mask that has its own kind of identity. Here, you know, the, the Betty Boop mask over the guy creates a sort of a doubling that's, that's, that's interesting and alive in the context of this, this moment with the other character wearing a kind of modern art landscape muumuu. I actually saw it like I was in Mallorca, uh, and for some reason in Mallorca, the older, older Mallorquin women tend to wear these incredibly ex like brilliant mumus. Um, here's this, uh, the idea of walking into the painting. I like somehow making paintings in which the spectator has a kind of surrogate inside the picture, so that this person is looking, we are looking at them looking. Um, and what they're looking at is maybe beyond or past this painting, this tree, which is sort of painting itself. So I, I have a little, um, a little section here of interspecies relationships, humans and animals. So I think of this one, um, getting back to the Christian theme. This is the caregiver. This is the good, the good, uh, the good man who who's taking care of the the animal, but maybe in fact the animal is some split off part of himself. You can see the little uh, bandage there on the... Here's another version, the nurse. This is the nurse version. Here comes the nurse, but now in a way tr sub transformed into the animal at the moment of her wound. Pet ownership. There is a, there's a kind of a growing literature um, that I think is very interesting. I haven't, I'm only beginning to kind of probe of interspecies studies. 
And I think of Don Haraway. There's a, there's a classic essay by Derrida actually about him and his cat, and the cat looks at him, and, and this, uh, this kind of thinking through of what it is to be a human, because being, uh, how we understand being human is, of course, underwritten by what is not human, which is to say animals, which is a kind of a, an odd construct. So you can kind of, there's lots of lively thinking uh, in that direction, kind of the twin of thinking about machines, and the machine as a sort of prosthetic human, maybe with, with, with another vexing um, question about you know, where the limits of you know, what, what the human is. Sometimes, yeah, so, so I like thinking about predation, like so you have pets and then you also have predators. I mean, and we don't very often anymore worry about being eaten by animals, but I think you know, somehow in the history of art, uh, especially like in the Roman era, uh, Christian era, that this, this, this anxiety gets played out all over and over. Sometimes, um, sometimes as a kind of celebration of power, like in the Roman sense. I mean, there's, it's, it's, it always has to do with, in a way, a kind of, a, what do you call it, exteriorized idea of power, still saturated with, with a kind of human ambition. This has a kind of anecdote. I had a friend when I was in Rome at the academy who's a medievalist who... Uh, who took up painting, he had a dream one night that I made a painting of Acteon, Acteon, the, uh, the hunter who stumbles upon Diana at her bath. She doesn't like it. She turns him into a steer, a, a stag, who's then ripped to shreds by his own dogs. In my friend's dream, um, they, weren't, they weren't dogs, they were puppies, and he was just kind of pestered by them. So he commissioned me, he gave me money, cash money, to make a painting. He said, do, you, do whatever you want. So this is, the, this is what I made for him. I made two versions just in case he could, he could choose one. I think he chose the right one. So here's various other kind of predation essays. I love the uh, image of Hercules and the, and the lion. There's, this is another image that kind of rolls through from Roman times into modern times. Because there, here's Hercules and the lion. They're in an embrace. They, they kind of are co-defining. They're locked in this, in this battle in so many representations. And then he wins, but then skins the lion. And you always know a picture of Hercules because he's wearing the lion. The head's kind of over his head. The paws kind of go over his shoulder. And so he, he's fused, fused with the lion. I kind of like, like this image of... Um, because, it, it, yes, it, it's, it has to do with interspecies, but I like thinking of interspecies maybe as a way to allegorize intersubjective or interpersonal, the kind of turbulence, the shared space. I mean, in, I mean, in some ways it makes sense. I mean, uh, I feel like developmentally, humans, individuals have to, have to work very hard to become an individual. Yes, you have a name, uh, but at birth, that's not the case. You're, you're, you're slurred. You're, you're, un, you're relatively undifferentiated. So this, this progress of autonomy is still underwritten by a kind of a memory or this, this notion of being of the with, of the other, that's, that, that haunts it, that maybe gets restored in relationships or maybe not. I liked in this painting that somehow the pink couch um, it was like a boat or something, and that, and, that the, and that the weight, too much weight on the left-hand side caused it to tip out of the, out of the picture, gave it a kind of a, an odd dynamic. It, this, in a way, it has still, still have some, some Disney modern art features, among other things. Here's another anecdote. My friend Steve Mumford went to Iraq as an embedded uh, artist during the, uh, actually all through it, but I think at this point um, he made a lot of drawings of Baghdad um, right after the invasion. And these were beautiful drawings from life. And I kind of, I liked thinking about Steve having been there. The drawing, that this process of drawing from life is almost always a kind of a testimonial of having been there. It says, you know, this isn't just a picture. This is a duration. This is a kind of a labor that is expressing this having been there in this. And so I wanted to kind of get, I wanted to reproduce a bit of that and then tell some kind of weird story. So that's me looking at, that, that, that is Steve 
it was a, it's from an image he, in which he put himself into a painting. And then up on top, I just projected one of his drawings to sort of, um, to sort of have, what, what would you call it, a set of kind of indexical links to that, that drawing that Steve made. So this is, this is, now we're coming up to the present. This is um, like from my show at Fredericton Fraser two years ago, Changing Shoes. You're thinking about gesture in a different way. I like somehow the way she, she seems like she's pushing um, at the inside of the picture plane. I don't know if the studio school still fetishizes this notion of picture plane. It's a very interesting uh, concept. Um, but here, here's, a, here's one, one thought about it. And I guess I thought, and, and actually like the, the, so her hand is way oversized, but then I actually pressed my own hand into the railing there as though she had somehow touched that with, within the picture. And I, and I hoped that that would make some sense of the strange tangle of gestures on the, on the far right, or rather would have a family connection to those gestures, or would invoke a notion of gesture that would they would include all of them. So this is another six foot painting. I was trying to figure out ways to, to really rock it out, so to speak. So, you know, to get a broom and to have the, have the canvas be sopping wet. And so when the broom mark hits it, it, uh, it registers it with a kind of intensity um, that would have, a, have its own life, a kind of abstract expression, a sort of way, except that these things you know, then I groom them and prune them and carefully narrativize them and add bits to them. So this one's maybe, I think this is like an eight, eight foot painting that I tried to kind of hang back and not get too, too obviously literal storytelling narrative, American chatty. Um, here's one with some finger painting on the right. Um, I probably should have hired the children, but, but they would not have been tall enough. Uh, <laughs> here's another painting. Maybe think about groups, how, you know, the, the solidarity of groups, the, the ritual uh, moment of, of putting out a fire with your urine. Kind of primordial, maybe kind of, um, maybe mythological moment. But I've been playing in bands recently, and I think about bands and their kind of peculiar family structures and the kind of stresses. So there's kind of the clown, clown band. So this one, all the black parts are a doodle. I had just finished reading, for the second time, Proust's book, that's books, however, you, however we refer to it, um, Recovery of Lost Time, amazing, amazing, Achievement, like in some ways, I, I, when 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 I was in the middle of it, I thought I, I don't really need to read anything else. I'll just read this, over and over. And so, right at the, when I finished, it turned out to be the hundredth anniversary of the publication of Swan's Way, and there was a show at Morgan Library, and I saw in the New York Times this image of his notebooks, which included a doodle. And so, this doodle is upside down. But I, so I thought, I, I want to make a painting in which I have that doodle, and so that, that strange, peculiar living link between his casual mark my, uh, you know, would, rub, would be articulated by me in a kind of super brittle slide projector copied way in a new context. And so this is the painting I made. More ways to think about gesture. Gesture is weather, maybe. Um, so I moved my studio out to Long Island City. So Silver Cup Studios, I don't know if you've been out there. It's a, it's, um, it's a very prominent, um, I guess, production house. Lots of films were made there. So interspecies in this case would be like, the, like different kinds of birds, but um, coupling, coupling in this kind of charged environment of longing desire. And that, um, I don't know if she's here. Jennifer Coates, who I'm married to, that's, that's her, for those who don't know her. I thought of this as maybe kind of mustard and ketchup. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but you know, one slightly more domesticated maybe than the other. Um, this, is in, this is from my show just, that just came down, I mean, from November. Very, this is very washed out, um, sadly. 
I like to think that this this painting really l leans on, lent on color, just as a sort of uh, a, a visceral and kind of um, uh, presence that carries uh, a lot of the kind of weight, meaning of it. And you know, looking at a slide of it is somehow not not getting at that. Although you do get this sort of the difference between the two the two beings here in contact. Here's more, I guess, thinking of the spectator inside the picture or, the, or, the, or this process of looking, looking back. I guess that's, that's, that's why I have these, these pictures organized this way. Um, the sort of artist, the artist dreamer um, not looking at their work, looking away, but also like the spectator, distracted, the distracted spectator. This was a curious thing. This was a painting I started years ago, which was just anomalous. It was, it was like these, a drawing. And it kicked around and, and got finished over and over. And then finally, somehow, this last year, I added the head. And so it was kind of like thoughts with, mixed with gesture, this attempt to kind of articulate with a hand, a sign. Maybe there's a kind of a bloody nose uh, allusion to it. And, and it finally like, was in my show just a few months ago. Um, so I like this idea maybe of collaborating with, earlier, with an earlier self, you know, in various stages. I, I'm always working on top of old prints. Um, it's just a way of, of somehow not, of, of bringing the other in, something from the outside into your process, um, which, which almost, you know, often runs the danger of becoming a kind of a closed, you know, private world, even if it is kind of socially engaged and, Here's a spaceman. I, so maybe this is like the spaceman who, who visited the uh, peculiar mating rights of, of white people in the 50s has now returned um, to witness this, uh, this overturned cement truck and its, and its kind of hallucinatory thought bubble. Well, that's what I'm doing here. This is, I'm thinking about thought bubbles. So in a way, the, a painting is the thought is a thought bubble of the artist, sort of separated from them and gone off in the world as a sort of uh, a picture of consciousness in action. Um, and so it seems like it's, an, it's a lively image worth, worth thinking about in, in paintings. Here's different sort of spectators, spectatorial relation, technological spectators. I guess maybe I'm thinking of the painting as the closed door. Uh, you know, there is something about a painting that's both a, a window and a, and a wall. It's a thing that's you know you cannot, you can see into. You feel it like you can see into, but it's but it's a skin. It's a surface, impenetrable one, and so that oftentimes harbors secrets or rumors. And so this is a, this is in a way an image of somebody listening at the door, um, imagining, wondering what's going on, on the other side of the door. Here she is again. The thing that interested me about this was her taut feet. So somehow, like I feel like her agency, her kind of um, intensity, her alertness, her quickening is registered in this in that mu muscled lift that that being on her toes gives. And here is the last image, looking back, saying thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you for, for listening to me, indulging me. I, I'm uh, eager and happy to answer questions of any, any sort. So if we could get the light, I see, I see a question now. Thank you.